Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out for the talk this afternoon. Uh, today, I would like to give a talk on our quest to update the MAD pages. Before we get started, I'd like to give a disclaimer. This research was done as part of the National Science Foundation here in the United States, and they always ask that we have the following disclaimer before we give our talks. Any opinions, findings, and conclusions or recommendations expressed in this material are those of the author and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. Now, I'm guessing that most of you here in the audience are mathematicians, and we as mathematicians love to find patterns and numbers. So I'm gonna show you a few numbers here on the screen, and I'd like to see if you can guess what the pattern is. All right, let's start here with 223. Let's see, we have 313, we have 525. So I'm looking at things you might think, well, they're prime numbers, but that can't quite be right because you have the 25 here at the end. Turns out here, the pattern is these are all dates. These are actually the dates that various African-Americans here in the United States perished this year. In particular, February 23rd was the date that Ahmed Aubrey died when he was fatally shot while jogging in Georgia. March 13th is the date that Brianna Taylor died after she was fatally shot by the police while she was sleeping. And March 25th is the day that George Floyd died after he died when the police knelt on his neck in Wisconsin. Now, I wanted to mention all of this to start by saying this talk is about Black mathematicians. And unfortunately, we as Black mathematicians have a duality. On the one hand, we are mathematicians, we love numbers. But on the other hand, we do have to deal with issues outside of just doing mathematics. And some of those issues are just trying to survive on a daily basis. Others, of course, are trying to make a living through our work. And one of the first real instances where many of us have seen this is through Katherine Johnson. There was a wonderful book put out a few years ago by Margot Lee Shetterly called Hidden Figures, which of course was turned into a movie. And in this, there was the discussion of a woman named Katherine Johnson who worked as a human computer for, at the time, what was the precursor to NASA. Now in 1962, she helped to work out the mathematics that put John Glenn in orbit around the earth. But there were some other issues that were also happening in the United States at the same time for Black women. I want you to mention another name that maybe many of you have not heard, Favine Malone Mays. Favine actually got her PhD from the University of Texas at Austin in 1966. So about the same time that Katherine Johnson was at the precursor to NASA doing her work, Favine was actually trying to get her PhD in mathematics, but it really was not an easy road for her. You see, just a few years before, in 1961, she had applied to the PhD program at Baylor University, also in Texas, but unfortunately, her application was denied. You see, at the time, they were not admitting African Americans into their school. Now, in this presentation today, I want to say a few more stories like this about various Black mathematicians. Then I eventually would like to get into some of the work that a few of us have done in trying to archive these stories and make them available for others around the world to learn. At the end, I then want to talk about other organizations and other individuals that are also working to help document the history of Black mathematicians. And then I'd like to come back and wrap up all of this by saying a bit, word, a bit more about Vivine Malone Mays. I myself was featured in the New York Times about a year ago, actually for a couple of reasons. One, I spoke quite a bit about being one of the only African-Americans in mathematics, and that could be one of the only that's a faculty member, but also as I was going up through my education, being one of the only in my classes. I also talked about how I left being at a Research One university for over a decade and decided that I would go to a smaller liberal arts college just outside of Los Angeles, California, where I could work more on trying to convince undergraduates that mathematics is a great career to be in. So here's a photo of my first year at Pomona College, where I decided to invite freshmen who expressed an interest in majoring in the mathematical sciences to come to dinner so we could fellowship and get to know each other. I thought at first only about eight students would show up, but it turned out that about 25 actually came to that dinner. My hope is that 
the in individuals that you see here in this photo will eventually major in mathematics. I could say that at least a few of them are still taking math classes and still majoring in the subject, and that eventually they'll go on to get their PhDs in mathematics. In fact, I want to spend a little bit even going over this question. How many African Americans do earn their PhDs in mathematics? Well, I mentioned back in 1966, Vivine Malone Mays received her PhD, but how many others about the same time were doing the same thing? The National Science Foundation has a list of data where they keep track of the number of PhDs that people have received. In fact, in 1968, there were roughly 23,000 doctorates that were awarded all over the United States in all disciplines. And roughly 1,000 of those went to those in mathematics and computer science. Of those 1,000, just under 10 went to African Americans in mathematics. By comparison, Vivian Malone Mays received her PhD in mathematics in 1966, and she was only the fifth African American woman to ever do so. Now let's fast forward to current times. In 2016, the NSF says that there were roughly 4,000 doctorates granted in the United States in mathematics and computer science, but just under 100 went to African Americans mathematicians. Now, let me try to put some of this in perspective for those of you that aren't here in the United States. Yes, you could argue that the numbers have gotten better and that over the past 50 years, we've doubled the number of Blacks getting their doctorates in mathematics, roughly from 2% to 1% to 2%. However, 12% is the number of Blacks living in the United States. This means that we have a long ways to go. We need to have more African Americans getting their PhDs in mathematics. Now, I've just mentioned the numbers, but I want to say a little bit more about who are some of these African Americans who earn their PhDs in mathematics. Vivian Malone Mays is just one, but who are some of the first? Well, here are some of the first African Americans that have earned their degrees. Albert Frank Cox is the first, and he received his PhD from Cornell University in 1925. He eventually would go on to become the department chair in mathematics at Howard University, a historically black college in Washington, DC. The second is Dudley Woodard. He actually got his PhD when he was about 50 years old. You see, he actually was on the faculty at Howard University, but then decided he really needed to go get his PhD if he wanted to continue to inspire more students to go on in mathematics. He got his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania in 1928, and then came back to continue teaching at Howard, where he established the Masters of Science in Math program the following year. One of the first students to graduate from this brand new master's program was William Clater. In fact, Woodard inspired William Clater to go on from the master's to get his PhD, and he did so in exactly the same department and exactly the same research area as Woodard did. He did so in 1933. Clater is considered to be the first African American to publish research in mathematics. And the fourth that I'll mention here is Walter Talbot. He received his PhD from the University of Pittsburgh in 1935. He would come back to become department chair at Morgan State University in Baltimore for almost 25 years. But those are the first three, first four men. I'd like to mention the first three women to receive their PhDs in mathematics. The first is Euphemia Lofton Hayes. She received her PhD from Catholic University in Washington, DC. The second was Evelyn Boyd Granville, who received her PhD from Yale University in 1949. She's actually still with us, still doing strong. And the third is Marjorie Lee Brown, who received her PhD the very next year in 1950 from the University of Michigan. And actually, the University of Michigan has a great colloquium series that they have once a year in honor of Marjorie Lee Brown. Now, those are just the first African Americans to get their PhDs, but now I'd like to say a little bit about more contemporary African Americans. And I want to go over some of the research that they are currently engaged in. The first that I'll mention is Floyd Williams. He received his PhD from Washington University in St. Louis in 1972. He actually works on problems in mathematical physics, such as special relativity, black holes, and even quantum mechanics. And he does so using representation theory and Lie algebras. He's one of the handful of African-Americans who's currently a fellow 
of the American Mathematical Society, the largest professional society in mathematics here in the country. Then there's Kate Okikiolu. She's a Nigerian mathematician and she received her PhD from UCLA in 1991. Many of you here in the audience may have heard of her father, George Okikiolu, another Nigerian mathematician. Kate actually works on a generalization of the concept of can you hear the shape of a drum by studying eigenfrequencies of a Laplacian so she can study the sounds a drum makes in three dimensions. She would be the first Black to be awarded the prestigious Sloan Research, Research Fellowship, and she did so in 1997. The next I'll mention is Arlie Petters. He received his PhD also in 1991, but from MIT. Um, he is from Belize, and he actually was ordered, or he was issued an order of the British Empire, so he's actually Arlie Petters, OBE. He works in gravitational lensing. He actually was the first recipient of the Blackwell Tapia Prize and is currently provost at NYU Abu Dhabi. The next I'll mention is Trichette Jackson. She received her PhD from the University of Washington in 1998, and she studies mathematical biology. In particular, she looks at the mathematics of angiogenesis. This is what happens when blood vessels are formed in the body to help cancerous cells grow. She was selected as a fellow for the Association for Women in Mathematics in its inaugural class back in 2017. Then there's Jonathan Mboyo Esole. He is from the Congo and he received his PhD from the Lorenz Institute at Leiden University of Netherlands back in 2006. He studies string theory by considering families of elliptic curves. And to be more precise, he actually looks at resolutions of singularities of specific elliptic surfaces. He was recently named a Next Einstein Fellow. And the last that I'll mention in this set is Chelsea Walton. She received her PhD from the University of Michigan back in 2011, and she studies non-commutative algebraic geometry. She recently won the Andrei Lichnerowitz Prize in Poisson Geometry, and she is the first woman to do so. Now, these are various stories of different mathematicians, but of course, you can ask the question, who is keeping track of these names and stories? If you wanted to find out about other individuals I've mentioned here, how might you do this? Well, this leads to the next part of my presentation. I'd like to spend some time for the next few minutes going over the MAD database and the work that I've done over the past few years to actually keep track of these various stories. Here, I'd like to start with an individual by the name of Scott Warner Williams. Scott, back about 20 years ago, worked on a website that he called MAD, the Mathematicians of the African Diaspora. This site here has over 1,000 pages consisting of various stories and biographies of Africans and African Americans in either mathematics, computer science, physics, or astronomy. He started the site in 1997 and really just worked on it purely out of a labor of love. Unfortunately, Scott retired back in 2008, which really means that this site has not been maintained in over 10 years. A few friends of mine decided that we would get together and talk about what we could do to help update these pages. Don King is at Northeastern University in Baltimore, Mass in Boston, Massachusetts. Asamoa Inquanta is at Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland. And John Weaver is at Varsity Software that's in Princeton, New Jersey. Over the last 10 years or so, we've all gotten together to help update the MAD pages. And the product that we have now is what you see here on the screen. We're actually pretty proud of this project. We just unveiled the new MAD pages about two weeks ago, although we've been working on this for a very, very long time. These pages now are actually part of a database. Before, Scott Williams just had pages here and there, different biographies, but we've decided to turn it into a database to make this searchable, to make it easy to figure out who's who, the areas that people are working in, what years that they've got their degree, and so on and so forth. So it was a massive undertaking, but we're really happy to say now that this site is live. So please take a look at it. Let us know what you think. We're always happy to hear feedback. Of course, we really wanted to make sure not only was the information transferred from Scott's old site to the new site, 
but we also wanted to make sure that the information would be current. Here's where I decided to use my funding from the National Science Foundation to run a six week program this past summer where I hired eight undergraduates to help with updating the information. In fact, as part of the six week program, we had three specific goals. The first, of course, was to work on this database and actually make sure that number one, all of the entries had some photo that was current. Number two, make sure that the employment information was as current as possible. And number three, to make sure that the contact information, including things like emails and websites, were all up to date. We were able to update all but 70 names out of our 712 name database. We also were able to add a few more names as well. Since remember, Scott retired about 10 years ago, and there are around 80 to 100 African Americans graduating with their PhDs every year. So we knew that we had another 800 names or so out there that we have to think about adding to the database. Second, we wanted to write biographies of Black mathematicians. We knew that Scott had written biographies of some individual, but we also knew that others of these individuals needed to have updated biographies. There were brand new individuals that we knew of out there. Again, Scott hadn't written since 2008. So we updated 54 biographies in this database. And third, we wanted to have biweekly colloquia that took place on Tuesdays and Thursdays so that we would learn about other individuals out there who are also doing work to document the history of African-American mathematicians. Roughly, there were 12 seminars over the summer, all but two now appear on YouTube. And I'll come back and say a little bit more about these seminars in just a moment. Here's a group photo from our work over the summer. Unfortunately, because of COVID-19, we could not meet face-to-face, -face, but we were able to meet every day online over Zoom. I just wanna say a little bit about the students that worked with me over the summer. They were really just the staff of two of us. So in particular, I'd like to thank my assistant, Amy Oden, for all of the work that she did and making sure that everything ran smoothly this summer. I'm very, very grateful to Amy. The eight students that we had over the summer are Malik Kanta, who is an undergraduate at Pomona College here in California, Nevin Etter, who is an undergraduate at Washington and Lee University, Jonalyn Fair, was a student at Southern University and a and College that's in um, New Orleans, Louisiana. Ramoy Hammond, who is at the University of Connecticut. Charles C.J. Hardnett, who's at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Jasmine James, who is at the Central Washington University. Alexis Kelly, who's at the University of California at Merced. And Jayla Langford, who's at Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana. So again, thank you students for all the work that you did this summer. I'm very, very grateful for it. I'll also mentioned that we had various virtual seminars. Here, you probably won't be able to see all of this here on your screen. It's just a quick listing of all of the talks and the titles and the individuals who were kind enough to grace us with an hour long presentation. If you'd like to either learn more about these or watch the presentations on your own, I do have the link here at the bottom of your screen. So please, Take a look, we do have all of these, most of these at least, on YouTube. Now that I've talked a little bit about the MAD pages and the work that we did to update them and to get the information out there, I want to say a little bit more about what some other organizations and conferences are either doing now or have done to help further along the stories of some of these Black mathematicians. So, what is currently being done to increase the participation of African Americans in mathematics? I want to say a little bit about a few organizations and conferences that we have here in the United States that maybe you haven't heard of, but you might want to be a part of one day. The first is the Conference for African American Researchers in the Mathematical Sciences, also known as CARMS. This conference started in 1994 with Raymond Johnson, Bill Massey, and, and James Turner. The idea is that it happens every summer and black mathematicians all get together to talk about their research for about a three, four day conference. The next is the EDGE program. This stands for Enhancing Diversity in Graduate Education. This was started in 1998 with Sylvia Bozeman and Rhonda Hughes. And what they wanted to do was run a four week program for women who had just finished their undergraduate degrees 
and we're starting a PhD program in mathematics that coming fall. This program here offers classes over those four weeks, but it also offers mentoring. It offers to be part of a larger network of women that have been involved with this for 20 years or so. And it's been a hugely successful program for women of color. The next is the Infinite Possibilities Conference, or IPC. This was started in 2005 with Leona Harris, Tanya Moore, and Nagambo Shaw, actually three women who were involved with Spelman College, a historically Black college in Atlanta. This conference takes place every two years and really is meant for women of color to fellowship and also to inspire each other to continue along in the mathematical sciences. This conference involves a wide range of individuals. Some are faculty, some are graduate students, some are even in high school, but it's a very influential conference in inspiring women to continue in the field. Then there's Mathematically Gifted in Black. This website was started in 2017 with Erica Graham, Reagan Higgins, Candace Price, and Shelby Wilson. The site actually features a brand new mathematician every day of our Black History Month. I know that in the UK, Black History Month is in October, but in the United States, Black History Month is in February. So for each of the 28 days every year, there's a brand new Black mathematician that is profiled. If you'd like to take a look at some that they profiled in the past, I definitely recommend that you take here at the take a look at the website. But certainly a lot of us look forward to this every year to see the brand new profiles that they have listed. And the newest site that I'd like to mention here is CMMS. This stands for the Center for Minorities in the Mathematical Sciences. This was just started this year, actually it was just launched a few weeks ago by Michael Young, who's at Iowa State University. Michael likes to think of this as a clearinghouse for all information for those minorities interested in the mathematical sciences. There's a listing of the various organizations and links so that you can look them up. There's a calendar in case you'd like to know the different conferences that are happening all throughout the country. And there's also a database for individuals that like to sign up to either be a mentor or just to learn a little bit more about what's happening. We, the Mad Pages, are working with CMMS to make sure that our databases are working with each other. I want to mention one last thing here along these lines in terms of organizations and events. There's going to be a series of tweets coming out from November 8th through 14th. Uh, there's a group of individuals here in the US, they're putting together what they're calling Black in Math Week. Here you can sign up to follow the Twitter account, but what they're going to do is every day between November 8th and 14th, they will tweet out a series of individuals who are Black and in mathematics. So if you'd like to learn more, I definitely say go ahead, take a look here at this Twitter account, but certainly we're asking you to follow along from November 8th through 14th. Now I mentioned earlier about Favine Malone Mays, how she got her PhD in 1966. I wanna say a little bit more about what was happening during that time frame, and how there's another organization that was also very much focused on furthering along these stories of Blacks in mathematics. Well, in 1969, there was the Joint Mathematics Meetings. This is a big meeting that takes place every year here in the United States, and in fact, it's considered to be the largest meeting of mathematicians um, here in the United States. In January of that year, there were 17 individuals who met in New Orleans so that they could discuss issues dealing with inclusion in the mathematical community. There were a lot of Black Americans who were finding it very difficult to find jobs, to attend conferences, to even get their papers published because of the rampant racism that was happening here in the United States. Well, here are these 17 individuals that you see on your screen got together and they would eventually form an organization called the National Association of Mathematicians. Essentially now, this is known as the Nationwide Organization of Black Mathematicians. There are two names in particular that I'd like to emphasize that you'll see here. Of these 17, you see Vivine Malone Mays was there at this meeting, January 26, 1969. She had only had her PhD for three years at this point. And you also see Scott Williams, the same individual from before, who had started the Mad Pages. He actually was a graduate student at Lehigh University working on his PhD in topology. Well, nowadays, NAM actually has a lot of events every year. It's considered to be the biggest 
organization for Black mathematicians in the world. It has events pretty much every season in the winter, spring, summer, and fall. In fact, the winter events is really considered to be the largest set of events throughout the year because everything takes place at the joint mathematics meetings. For example, there's the Haynes Granville Brown session that really features brand new doctoral recipients, those new Black mathematicians that are just coming out. There's also a banquet that features the Clayton Woodard Lecture, the Lifetime Achievement Award, and also the Stephen Shabazz Teaching Award. So there's a lot that happens there at the joint mathematics meetings. In the spring, roughly around spring break, there is a faculty conference for faculty in various regions throughout the country to get together once a year to talk about either the research that they're working on in either mathematics or mathematics education. In the summer, there is a big lecture called the Blackwell Lecture, which takes place at the Math Fest run by the Mathematical Association of America. And then finally, the big flagship event that NAM puts on is NAM's Undergraduate Math Fest. This is a three-day conference where undergraduates give talks to other undergraduates on the research that they've done. I wanna show a few pictures here of the most recent Math Fest that we had that was held face-to-face. -face. Um, I was actually president of NAM for the last five years, and this was the last big conference that I helped to run for the organization. You can see here a picture of myself, my vice president, Naomi Cameron on the right, and then my two undergraduates from Pomona, Miles Achute and Brian Bishop. But it was a wonderful conference. We actually had a lot of people that attended. There were at least 100 individuals there. So I highly recommend to take a look at NAM, or at the very least, take a look at the NAM Undergraduate Math Fest. Now I want to end by going back to Vivian Malone May. So I tried to say a little bit about how some of us are keeping track of these stories, a little bit about what's also happening now to, to motivate other black mathematicians to continue in the field. But I wanna go back to Vivian Malone Mays herself and about her personal story. As I mentioned, she was a professor at Baylor University, but I also mentioned that she wanted to attend Baylor to get her PhD but she was denied admission because of her race. So it's a very tricky story here and what's happened over her career. So let me just try to give some outlines of who she was and what she did. She was born on February 10th, 1932 in Waco, Texas. This is right around Dallas, Texas in the middle of the state. She entered Fisk University at the age of 16 and Fisk is a historically black college that is in Nashville, Tennessee. She earned a bachelor's degree in 1952 and then decided to stay on for a couple of more years to get her master's degree. You see, she had a couple of mentors who were mathematicians who really encouraged her to go into mathematics. In fact, Malone Mays actually switched from medicine to math because of these two mentors, Evelyn Boyd Granville and Lee Lorch. You may remember the name Evelyn Boyd Granville. She is the second African-American woman to get her PhD in mathematics. That means that there was a lot of influence from Evelyn Boy Granville to really convince Vivian Malone Mays to stay on to get her PhD. And this is exactly what Malone Mays did. She actually decided to work as department chair at a couple of other historically Black colleges in Texas. But at that time, she still applied for admission to Baylor University. And as I mentioned earlier, she was not admitted because at the time, in 1961, Baylor was not admitting Black students into their school at all. So instead, she applied to work at the University of Texas at Austin. She would eventually get her PhD in 1966 with the dissertation entitled A Structure Problem in Asymptotic Analysis. She was only the fifth African-American woman to get a PhD in mathematics. I'm going to come back and say more about the story in just a moment. Following graduation, she was hired as a full-time professor of mathematics at Baylor University. So here's the fascinating story. She wanted to get a PhD from Baylor. She was denied admission because she was Black. But then here it is five years later, she comes back with her PhD, and she's actually hired on as the first Black professor that Baylor had ever had. Now, she had a great career, a wonderful career there at Baylor. Unfortunately, she died relatively young. She died at the age of 63 in June 9, 1995. But as I mentioned, Baylor knew that it had this fascinating story. And on the one hand, it was very proud that she was at Baylor. But on the other hand, it was very embarrassed at how it had treated her just five years before. 
Well, in just February of last year, there was a big celebration that was given by the mathematics department where they unveiled a bust to honor Vivine Malone Mays there in the mathematics department. At the upper left, you'll see a picture of the department chair giving the talk. Here on the lower right, you actually see a picture of her daughter who's accepting the bust. I was also invited as president of NAM to give a quick speech here at the press conference. And here we have at the very bottom left, a picture of myself and my friends standing next to Vivian Malone's mazes bust in the mathematics department. What I'd like to do is read a short excerpt of the speech that I gave there at the press conference. My mathematical isolation is complete. This is a phrase uttered by Dr. Vivian Malone Mays after her lonely experience attempting to get a doctorate in mathematics. And in many ways, I can relate with Dr. Malone's experience. At the age of 16, she went to Fisk University where she met Lee Lorch and Evelyn Boyd Granville. Dr. Granville was just the second African-American woman to receive a PhD in math. You can imagine what that did to Dr. Malone's imagination. So Dr. Malone decided to continue her education by going to the University of Texas at Austin. There, she met the infamous Robert Lee Moore. Perhaps he was a man of his era, but he was known for being especially nasty to Jews, to Blacks, and to women. Dr. Malone was the only woman in her class and the only African-American. You see, she couldn't attend class. She wasn't allowed to teach as a teaching assistant. She couldn't even go to the local coffee shop to join in the study sessions. My mathematical isolation is complete. But Dr. Malone persisted. Dr. Malone had grit, class, and determination that we should all emulate. Dr. Malone, we thank you. I'd like to end here with a quote by an African-American who started Black History Month here in the United States, Carter G. Woodson. It says, we have a wonderful history behind us and it is going to inspire us to greater achievements. I do want to thank the following individuals before I go any further, the National Science Foundation, of course, for funding all of this, Pomona College for its wonderful support over the years, Corey Colbert at Washington Lee University, Helen Barcelo at the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute, Albert Lewis and Harry Lucas from the Educational Advancement Foundation. Of course, I must thank Scott Williams without whose work none of this would have been possible. And finally, Naira Chamberlain and the Institute for of Mathematics and its applications. So to you all there in the audience, thank you very much for listening.